Hello world of YouTube and welcome to the listening log update for March of 2020. Now I have 11 records on the dock to talk about this month. I got one of the requests that I had knocked out of the way. I was trying to get two, but I couldn't get to the second one and feel comfortable with it, with it enough to do a review. So we had 11 records, some pretty uh, highly anticipated stuff, some surprises that came out, just a general broad spectrum of shit covered. So let's just, let's just start, start dissecting, shall we? You guys know I, I loved uh, Caroline Rose's last record, Loner. I thought it was a great melding of indie pop with some off-kilter indie sort of alternative tendencies uh, with its synthetic usage. And it just had a nice bite to it as well. But I was, I was curious to see where she would take her sound after that record sort of success in its own way. And on Superstar, I feel like she does a good job at kind of going further down the indie path. You know, a lot of this record is a lot less rock-centric. It's a, it, There's some funk in here with some of the bass work on tracks like Do You Think Will Last Forever or Feel The Way I Want, but it definitely has its own weirder vignettes that feel almost like a bridge between St. Vincent's early material and her later material. Uh, I get some heavy St. Vincent vibes from this record, but it's not a bad thing. I think it's a, it's a great idea to sort of reinvent that sound and I like what she does with it whether it's with those tight grooves on those tracks or the opener nothing's impossible or the super woozy synth infused tracks like the closer I took a ride or someone new which just feels like her crooning over these well constructed synthetic pieces really my biggest issue with the record is the sort of sonic offshoot command Z um, it just feels like a sort of filler interlude track that doesn't add a whole lot to the sound other than more weird synths, please. Um, but I like that this album has its own sense of dreariness, it has its own sense of questioning in the lyrics, and I like the picture, the sort of morbid picture Caroline Rose paints with on this. It actually reminds me a lot of the writing on early St. Vincent, and I'm only drawing that heavy comparison because, I mean, it's it's... I feel like it's super apparent, but it's also just like, it's not utilized terribly. Like this is a way of using an influence or maybe not intentionally using an influence, but using a style in a way that still feels relatively fresh. And I think it helps that St. Vincent's off doing her own crazy shit. But I like what Caroline Rose is doing here. I love the writing. I love the grooves. I love that it, it juxtaposes those grooves against really washed out synthetic backdrops. I think it's a beautiful pairing that I think works incredibly well. Um, it's one that I've kept coming back to because I love its sound so much. I personally would feel on this record as like an 8 out of 10. I think it's really good. If you like Loner and you like the more sort of organ-infused sounds that she was toying with on there and you'd like to see that explored a little further with some more synthetic stuff, maybe some more tighter grooves, check out this record. I think I think it holds up pretty well. I think it's a nice expansion on the sounds she was playing with on there. Like Caroline Rose's Superstar, Gvelotox Split was another record that I was heavily anticipating because while some may think that they've kind of played out their sound uh, over the course of the decade, I've I thought that they just kept it consistent. I think they're one of the more consistent rock bands doing it now. I like their infusions of sort of black metal aggression and density at points with some nice bluesy southern infused riffage. I think that I could see why some would think it's it's a bastardization of a genre that people hold sold hold so dear to their chest. I personally can't get enough of it. I think that if there's one band that's doing something at least interesting with rock, it's Cavallo Talk. And I think it's interesting that in a decade where so many other artists like Southern were infusing black metal ideas into other genres, this was a line that just was crossed too many times. But I think, <clears throat> and especially on the newest record, Split, they just kind of do it again. You know, this is their longest record by a, by a small margin, and they definitely take those longer songs and try to do more ambitious things with them. And I feel like more often than not, it pays off because they are self-aware enough to know what type of music they're making. They, they even have a part where they just call out for air guitar because they know that you're going to have fun rocking out to this thing. The points where they get really intense and blast beat filled are here, but they are, you know, 
handled gracefully amongst these songs that have catchier writing and a good swagger to their playing. Um, I think it's interesting as well that they brought on Troy Sanders from Mastodon on the track Crack of Doom, which I think provides a great melody to their chorus. But not only that, they, they have other tracks here as well, like Discord and Tevling that also, again, infuse these catchier writings with some incredibly razor-sharp, rugged guitar work. And I think that it's, it's, it's still pretty fucking good. I think my biggest complaint would be that some of the longer songs are a little bogged down. There's some songs where they don't necessarily utilize eight minutes to a, a resounding, interesting, consistent capacity. But, again, those issues are few and far between on an otherwise incredibly solid rock album. I feel like if you enjoy output from bands like um, newer era Mastodon or Baroness or bands like Cancer Bats and you want something just as rugged or, or if you like bands like the heavier moments on the damned things or you know every time I die if you like some gritty vocals but you don't mind when they get a little more brittle and, and pummeling with some blast beats you'll enjoy Valor Talk and you'll enjoy Split I think it's a solid enough record I'm giving it a 7 out of 10 really worth your time if you like that style <laughs> I checked out Placement because, you know, I've, I've been following Wazzy's work relatively for, you know, since he since he popped into the discography review back in the day. I'm going to be doing a reformatted discography review. But even in the time between that, I'm loosely following his stuff. I got back into him heavily back in 2016 because I was liking the sounds and Times Infinity. And I'm glad that he's in this kind of resurgence of creativity. You know, I, I didn't hate Complaint. I thought it was pretty solid. My issues with it were more kind of the sort of tempid kind of blandness to some of it. It felt very derivative of acts that have also been kind of coasting on their own autopilot for the last couple of records. But on Placement, which I guess is the second in a trilogy of records, he seemingly adds a bit more juice to his sounds. The instrumentals on here are a lot more soaked in a, in a sort of a lo-fi atmosphere that I think suits Watsky really, really well. It reminds me of some of the instrumentals on like Times Infinity, but in a fresher sort of way. There's weird sample work like on Best Friend on the Floor or Savage. You know, he's doing a lot more just straight up singing and crooning like on Undermine and on the rapid fire intro of Advanced Placement. You know, he's, he's experimenting with different things that still feel very in line with Watsky's sound as a whole, the sound he's been kind of forging on over the last decade. And on placement, I feel like because of the instrumental work, it elevates this project just a little more the complaint. I like the lo-fi edge, not that I hate the sort of laid back sort of alternative hip hop style that was on there that reminded me of kind of the more middle of the road atmosphere releases that came out over the last decade. But I like that he's elevating it a little more on this project. I like that he's, you know, he's still trying his best to, to make the singing thing work in a way that is different than how it was working on Cardboard Castles, and I think it works better here. And I like that he's still kind of keeping into the mindset of what the writing was on the last record, and kind of, again, giving me some old-school Watsky vibes and some of the hooks on here, um, like on The Price of Growing Up, and a little bit on the more experimental free flow forms of dreams and bones i can see why some people maybe turn off on the song because it's like 11 minutes of some spoken word style stuff but i like that stuff i, I like the spoken word stuff of watsky i've always thought it was is more compelling than him just writing pop rap for pop rap's sake um and i like that he's trying to be a little more ambitious on this project as a whole even if at some points it still feels like he's trying to play the same ropes people expect from him at points I do think this is still a step up, if, if only just for a couple of things. Um, I'm giving this a 7. I still think it's really, really solid. I think that he could work on a singing a little bit, but I, I like the direction that this album goes in, if only because the production's better, and he seemingly has a little more fire in his gut after complaint, and I'm happy about that. So this is a request by JC Lexicon. Uh, Josh, long-time viewer of the channel, been subscribed for pretty much the entire time I've been on the platform, uh, requested this album from a Canadian producer, Eloquent, Forever is a pretty long time. I love the sounds on this thing, man. 
It's lo-fi infused, jazz inspired hip hop. Of course I like that shit. Have you listened to the music I've been putting out lately? Um, and on this record, I, I've never checked out any of this artist material before, but I kind of get a feel for their vibe, at least on this project. And I dig it. I dig it a lot. I like the horns on the, on the opener, and I like how um, he's able to craft these very old-school style instrumentals, but put rappers on them that put a contemporary twist on it, like on Lottery Check or on Annoyed or on Thread Count. I like that there's a sense of catchiness still to some of, the tra some of those tracks, like on annoyed or on guillotines or airwalk i love the more in the just instrumental passage as well i love the the interpolation on joe loft i think it's a really cool again contemporary reinvigoration of that lo-fi jazzy aesthetic it's it's a really good project if you like you know uh if you liked blockhead's last release or if you enjoy the art the work of nujibis you'll probably like this project i know nujibis is kind of the immediate sort of calling card for that lo-fi aesthetic but he was the progenitor of it and he has kind of created a whole subgenre, even if he's not alive to see it burgeon um, and I think the Eloquence latest project at least is a great slice of that as well um, mm -hmm. I'm giving this project an 8 out of 10 I think it's fantastic thank you for the recommendation don't be surprised if you see me hopping on Joloff at some point in the near future just for fun so as you could probably guess, I'm not really a big Lil Uzi Vert fan. Kind of falls in a camp that I'm pretty quick to not indulge in all that often. Not that I hate trap music, I've had a couple records on here that I've given moderate to high scores in the genre, but this specific lane of trap has never really been my steez personally. But I do think that Lil Uzi Bird at least has one great single on his hands in the form of EXO Tour Life. I think it's a great encapsulation of his aesthetic and his style with a decent hook around it. And this is the first record of his I'm really giving any time to, A Turtle to Take. And I think it's, it's another bloated trap record that does not offer all that much as far as variety to justify its over an hour runtime. There are moments that I enjoy on here though. Either Uzi is doing something interesting or the beat is doing something interesting like Homecoming. I love the punchy brass you know, punches that are on the hook of the song. I love the darkness in the beat, You Better Move. I love the song as a whole, Bust Me. I think it's a really good song. I love the hook on I'm Sorry. I love the hook on Celebration Station. But either the hook is working and the beat's doing a good job at amplifying that or there's a clashing of it, like on Pop or the writing on Silly Watch and Low Main. There's, there's a lot on here that is held back because I don't think Uzi is that great of a rapper. I just, I don't think he gets it, he gets in the pocket as much as a lot of other rappers that I enjoy, or a rapper in the trap scene that I think does a good job, obviously, Denzel Curry. Obviously, they're two very different types of rappers in the trap scene, but if we're talking about dudes who go over bangers, I think that Uzi, especially his style of writing, just doesn't fit a lot of the ideas that these instrumentals may pull up. I also don't think his metaphor game is all that strong. Dude calls pussy kitty so much, I think he's actually talking about cats. Like, it's just, it's it's held back by a lot of the things that I don't personally enjoy from this genre uh, of music. While it has its better moments as a whole, I don't enjoy sitting through this because of its bad hooks or its weak writing or its poorly done metaphors. I'm going to be giving this a 3 out of 10. Not the worst thing I've heard this year, but it's it's pretty high up there to me personally. Complete opposite side of that spectrum, The Weeknd makes one of his best records of his career with After Hours. I have, I've said it in my anticipated records of the year, I really like all the songs building leading up to this record, and it had me really amped to hear what Abel was going to do on a release following a, a huge collaboration with Daft Punk. And he doesn't disappoint at continuing to embrace retro sounds 
in a very weekend sort of way. And that's this album's biggest strength to me. I mean, even the singles that came out before this thing were a great sampling of what this record was going to offer, even if they are in different ways. Like, there are still tracks like the title track and Heartless that feel more in line with Abel's other stuff, like on Snow Child or Escape from L.A. or um, the opener Alone again to an extent. But even those songs infuse some of the very 80s-leaning synths that were on Blinding Lights, which is the takeaway song from this record, apparently. But it's also the best sort of stage setter for the project because while it takes a while to build to it, it's a hell of a build, but this record is full of old school synths, whether it's on tracks like Faith or In Your Eyes, or even again on the other tracks that I talked about that kind of infuse Abel's old sound with his new sound. But there's also tracks like Snow Child that do that, or one of the tracks that I think is more interesting, Too Late, which interpolates this almost sort of drum and bass, sort of break beat inspired instrumental in a way that is awesome. And I love the synthetics on this record across the board. It's clear that he took that sort of influence that Daft Punk kind of put on Starboy and fleshed it out in a way that feels a lot more in line with Abel's sounds that he's done over the last 10 years almost now. And I like that on this project, he doesn't just do his same old shtick lyrically where he's talking about sex and cocaine. Still talks about drugs. Cocaine is still referenced on here a lot. I mean, it's an 80s influenced R&B record, how could you not at least dabble a little bit in cocaine lyrically? But this record's a lot more mournful, a lot more sorrow-filled, it's a lot more sad, and I kind of like that about it. You know, I like that he's being more reflective and talking about a lost love, and now he, he hates that he's there, but he's been put back in the spot where he's back on his bullshit, as it were. And I, I, I think that that's really nice. I think that he does a good job at sort of reinterpreting what it means to sound like he does and spin it in a way that feels really fresh without losing a sense of catchiness like tracks like heartless obviously but blinding lights as well i love the end of faith you know it has this real sense of gravitas to it that i don't think he would have reached on those earlier projects of his i think that he does a good job at upping the scope and scale while also experimenting sonically i fucking love this record. I think it's a fucking bop. It's one of his best records of his career, in my opinion. I think it's a lot more consistent. It's a lot tighter. It's not as, you know, lofty and bloated as some of the tracks on Trilogy or Kiss Land. It, it ke keeps the catchiness scene on Starboy and Beauty Behind the Madness, but it, it, it again, expands his sounds in ways that make sense, given his recent material, and I'm excited to see him continue to experiment and create this sort of all-new era for him, and I hope that it, it proves to be very successful for him, because I love this record. I'm giving this an 8. I love the sounds, I love the synths, I love his singing, and I love the hooks when they're there, and I love that it's something different from him in a familiar sense. There's one moment on this new Childish Gambino record that I feel like sums up the album as a whole, and it's that moment on 1238 where he's talking about doing drugs in somebody's kitchen while he's waiting for them to come back, because this feels like a drug trip that just went on for way too long. There's parts of this album that I do really like. I think that the track with Ariana Grande, Time is Cool, I love the the rhythms on algorithm and I like the hook of it. I like the beat of it. I like that it's abrasive. I feel like he tries to dabble into it again on 3222, but it feels a lot more Kanye inspired than algorithm did um, in, a, in a way that I don't enjoy. That feels like him trying to tap into like a life of Pablo era Kanye in a style that just doesn't work for me personally. Honestly, a lot of this record reminds me a lot of Life of Pablo, the more that I think about it. My immediate comparison to this project was Tyler the Creator because of tracks like 1238 or 4226, which have sounds that feel more inspired by Tyler the Creator. But the project as a whole feels a lot more inspired by Kanye West. And it's not all bad. Like I said, I like Algorithm. Um, I like the track with Ariana Grande, Time. I love the Prince-inspired track 3531. I'm looking at the tracks here because I don't remember the time codes that this project has as a whole. And I feel like that is a part of making this album feel almost identityless because there's so many different avenues that he's playing with on this project. And while I feel like some work, some don't. And 
partially it's because this record is so doused in ambiguity that even the tracks like Feels Like Summer, which were singles beforehand, now just have this timestamp as the title in a way that just strips any personality. I think it's experimental in a way that he brought this out. I think it's a very experimental release on here. He could have just fleshed out the ideas on Awaken My Love and called it a day. And I respect that while he does do that on some instances on here, like some of the ones I mentioned, um, he's just a little too all over the map for me, man. Like, I like it. I like Donald Glover. I like parts of this project, just like I like parts of every Gambino project, but I like this one a little less than Awaken My Love. I don't think it's terrible. I just think it's a little too wrapped up in its ideas or tries too hard to be so ambitious, like on the opener, which is just a really drawn out acapella buildup. Um, or the track 4748, which takes this funk groove and plays with it for six minutes. Again, it's just a drug trip that goes on for just a little too long for my taste. Um, I'm giving it a six. It's fine. Again, there's parts that I like and parts that I don't, and they kind of all come together in this in this mess, this this unholy mess that feels void of character because of its presentation. expecting to come out of this whole isolation in the house thing that's going on right now this whole quarantine if you will is that my favorite band would drop an extension to one of their more independently revered projects of their entire career the the ghost series i like the ghost series i've talked about it a handful of times now i think they're really cool conceptually and i think that it gave trent and atticus this this idea of working together in an instrumental sense that I feel like helped birth the run of soundtracks they did over the last decade. And now they're coming together to make two more additions to that after a decade of making film work. And I feel like it's a much more tighter listening experience. Both discs, Together and Locus, have their own vibes. Together is a lot more ambient, it's a lot more spacious, it's a lot more drawn out, uh, sonically it's a lot more airier, and I'm cool with that. I like the sounds on it a lot. It reminds me a lot of the soundtrack they work work they did for one of the documentaries they did soundtrack work for or the mid 90s soundtrack is a lot more spacious than sound whereas locus has a lot more anxiety inducing the pianos on here are done with percussion in a way that's a lot more purposeful um like on the opener the cursed clock or run for your life or turn this off please where they just get a lot more cacophonous and noisy in a way that plays really well against together because while together has this very airy presentation the closer still right here has this sense of propulsion to it that i feel like kicks off that disc well and bleeds into locus beautifully you know because there's other tr things on here there's other textures that they inject on here that help it stand apart from the soundtrack work and makes it feel very indebted to the nine inch nails of today like on the brass on every around every corner or uh the sort of sonic character of the worryment waltz on locus you know they do a lot more to make this feel separate from their soundtrack work because they are both they are both in both projects now and i love the sounds on here i also think that their soundtrack work as a whole helped characterize this project because unlike the other ghosts all of these songs have titles they have clear sonic ideas behind the soundscape because while they are instrumental their titles play into the tone something that i feel like childish gambino's last record could have benefited a lot from while i like the ambiguity of the ghost records it makes sense for them it doesn't make sense for childish gambino to release a project where all almost all of the songs are numbers except for two again it plays into the whole this is a bad drug trip mentality whereas these records they just feel like very fleshed out pieces of ambience and industrial noise some of the shit is some of the most abrasive shit trent and atticus have ever pulled together and i'm happy about that there's one thing that's come from this entire shit stain of this quarantine thing that's going on it's these projects they fit the theme of isolation and cold loneliness really well with the erratic madness that's going on in a lot of the world right now it's an incredible uh pair of releases 
that I just, I really love, and I'm glad that they put out. You know, I'm talking about them together because they are companion pieces. They are a piece of a whole puzzle, but I feel like these two are different enough from the initial run of Ghost releases that make them something better, something bigger. Um, I will be doing a recontextualized discography at some point, including this in there, like I will do with the Beck and all the other discographies I will be doing. So I'll be talking about them in a discography sense at some point in the future. But as far as my rating for these two records, um, if I'm going to rate them separately, I personally like the, the anxiety-inducing and Locust more, but I'm giving them both an 8 because I think they're both amazing records that I feel like are a testament to... It, it, may, it, it let their soundtrack work pay off in a way that I don't think fans were expecting. Because this was a huge surprise, but one that I'll take with open arms. I had a premonition that we fell into a rhythm where the music don't stop for life. I never hated Dua Lipa's work. I liked some of her singles before off of her last record, but this is the first full experience I'm getting of Dua Lipa on Future Nostalgia. You know, it's a project that I've been kind of Wanting to, my ears have been perking up more for now because of Don't Start Now. I think that's an incredible, incredible throwback single. I love the slap bass on that. I love the slap bass on a majority of this project. I think that it's great that she is so indebted to this melding of past and present in the future. <laughs> but I like that she's infusing them in a way that fits the album's motifs sonically narratively lyrically if you will while also just being also very buoyant in lyrics you know it's reflective it's 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 her moving on in her own sense and trying to grab her life back by the horns and i love that um i love the sleek sexiness on physical and on Good and Bed, even if Good and Bed's one of the weaker tracks to me personally, I feel like it sonically just doesn't fit the rest of the record. In fact, I feel like uh, Break My Heart should have been the closer. It's a much more big climax for the album to end on, even if I think Boys Will Be Boys is a very cheeky song that uses its message in a very heavy way. Um, and I, I, I appreciate the use of like a girl's choir to reinforce the message. I still feel like Break My Heart is a better closer for the record, both narratively and lyrically. Break My Heart feels like the sort of turning the screw to something else entirely, flipping the page, bringing it to a close. It also has the same sounds that have been toyed throughout the record in the last two songs. Don't really do that. The whole record's been kind of synth, disco-infused, uh, slap bass-filled pop music, and the last two songs aren't that. But... Outside of that, I think this record is great. The bass on this thing, every single time, every single bass line on this thing is fucking tight. As a huge fan of funk and synths, talked about that a lot in this channel, this is more of that in a way that I wasn't fully expecting to have a full embrace of. You know, artists do this type of song all the time, but their records don't normally sound this sonically consistent. But it is there, and I am all for it. I love the hooks. I love the playful string work. I love the track Hallucinate specifically. The string work on that in the beginning that then comes back, the sample that comes back in the chorus and is reinterpolated in the bridge. Oh my god, it's so fucking good. It's so amazing. And this has bop after bop. It is a great pop record. One of the best pop records I've heard of the year so far. Giving this an 8 out of 10. Fantastic. Let's... let's Let's close this month off. I'm a, pretty, I'm a pretty moderate Pearl Jam fan. I liked them a lot back when I was in middle school and high school. I listened to them a lot along with bands like Soundgarden and the whole grunge scene, you know. I, I, and I think Pearl Jam's career, while not necessarily the most consistent, has had its interesting, you know, places it's gone post their huge success in the 90s. You know, I thought that their self-titled record was a nice bounce back from some of the more lofty ideas, even if it still had its own lofty idiosyncrasies. And I think that Backspacer was a tighter return to form for them. I may have slept on Lightning Bolt, but I didn't want to sleep on Gigaton because, well, again, it had Pearl Jam sort of branching out after a couple of records in a safer territory. You know, with tracks like Dance of the Clairvoyance being this more talking head seemingly inspired track that had this synthetic groove 
that I think was an interesting change of pace for the band. And while it's not necessarily all over the record, it's still here on tracks like All Right. And th they present a pretty damn good return once again on Gigaton. I think that this record is very, very solid. I think with a little more tweaking, some trimming, because Pearl Jam records always have kind of a problem of being a little too bloated, you could make an even better record out of this. Like, out of all the records I've talked about this year, this is the one that's most up for Redacted in my eyes, because I think that there is some great stuff here. I love the opener, Whoever Said, I think it has a great chorus. I love Dance to the Clairvoyance. Um, I love Quick Escape with its kind of razor guitars that are in there. I think it's a nice pummeling rock tune, and tracks like that and Never Destination are great other kind of cut the crap rock tunes. And I like that they get a little more soft and lofty in their own Pearl Jam ways on tracks like Retrograde and River Cross. While I don't think they need to close the record, I do enjoy their inclusion. And I really like the song Seven O'Clock. I think it's a sharply written song that is paced beautifully, even for its six minute runtime. It's a bit chunkier than your average Pearl Jam song, but they utilize that time very, very well. I feel like this shows this band may be old, but they aren't afraid to branch out and take risks for them and try to find a way to make them work. I think that the band as a whole is doing a lot. And I even like one of the more weirder lyrical vignettes they take on this record with Buckle Up. It's got a darker edge to it that I feel like suits Pearl Jam's sort of edgier side pretty well in my opinion. But I feel like this record, while it has its own experimental moment, moments or sort of grander moments like seven o'clock there are some that just don't deliver quite as well like comes then goes a little too drawn out it's not quite like seven o'clock as far as the writing is, writing is considered or super blood wolf moon which is like a lot more of a weirder written record it's similar to buckle up in that regard but it's a song that doesn't hit as hard as say buckle up does for me and it sticks out since it comes pretty early on and is sandwiched between two of the records better moments as far as a rock song is considered and uh whoever said and the more experimental stuff like dance the clairvoyance it's one moment on the record that just doesn't land well for me whether it's its placement or the actual subject matter of the song i don't know but i feel like this is a much more solid record than it could have turned out to be given its experiments and weird ideas um and i think it's pretty solid i think it's worth your time if you like pearl jam and you want to see them sort of continuing to venture forth and making rock music that's well written or edgy or just well constructed you can't go wrong with gigaton i'm giving it a 7 out of 10 i think it's pretty fucking solid and well worth your time if you like this stuff and that's gonna be the month what did you think about it what did you think of the records that i talked about did you like them did you not let me know in those comments down below i still have a couple requests on the docket the new soccer mommy record was requested along with the newest intronaut release which i'll be trying to get to over the next month but if there's something else you would like for me to talk about linked in the description is the listening log you can see what i have on my general radar and what's been requested along with any projects that i may have dropped if you didn't know i work on music but either way i'm gonna get out of here if you like this video be sure to give it a like if you want to see more of my music gaming and general nerdy content be sure to subscribe special thanks to my patrons if you would like to Join their ranks, get early access to content, get exclusive content, or help drive the community. It's linked in the description. I'm going to get out of here. Thank you so much for watching. I've been Vowel Rack. You guys have good inside situations, and I'll see you another day. <laughs>